So we're going to do a couple of examples about the relationship between voltage difference and electric energy. And this example is going to assume that we have a Van de Graaff generator that has been charged and has a negative charge on the dome. And somebody's going to bring their hand near that uh, Van de Graaff generator. And as you might have seen when you do that, sometimes you can get a spark to go between the generator and the hand. And I'm going to assume that that spark in this example went this way. Came so some uh, a spark went from the generator to the hand. And if you've learned about sparks, uh, air is normally an electrical insulator and charge does not freely flow through air. But if we get a really strong electric field, uh, we can ionize the air by removing electrons from the oxygen and nitrogen atoms in the air. And then the air has freely moving charges. Air becomes a conductor once it's ionized. And it turns out that um, the electric field magnitude needed to ionize dry air is 3 million newtons per coulomb. If you get that much electric field, the air will be ionized, become a conductor, and that's when sparks will happen because electrons can then freely move uh, from the generator to your hand. So we're going to assume that we have that much electric field strength in this problem. Um, I'm also going to draw the direction of the electric field. So we have a negatively charged Van de Graaff here, and um, we know that a positive test charge would be attracted towards that Van de Graaff at any location. So I'm going to draw the electric field lines coming in directly towards the center of that Van de Graaff, kind of like this. I'm not going to draw all of them, just some of them. So that's my electric field direction. All right, so how does this relate to voltage difference? Well, we learned earlier that um, voltage is electric height. It's the product of electric field and the height that you are above the lowest place in that electric field. And that's actually true, strictly true, only for a uniform electric field. There's a slightly different relationship if it's not a uniform electric field. Um, however, in this problem, we're going to have a uh, look at the difference in voltage, the difference in electric height between the surface of the Van de Graaff and this person's hand. And as you can see from the way I drew the electric field lines, if these lines were all parallel and equally spaced, then that would be a uniform field. These lines get a little bit farther apart from each other as I go farther away from the Van de Graaff, which means the electric field is actually a little bit weaker out here than it is uh, in close to the Van de Graaff. However, um, the Van de Graaff uh, is fairly big compared to this distance. I didn't really draw this to scale. We're going to assume that the length of this spark is five centimeters. All right, and so we're going to define our height to be zero. I'm going to put a reference line here at the lowest place which is the place towards which the electric field is pointing. I'm going to define that to be my zero height place. And we're going to define the hand's location to be a height of five centimeters. And we're going to pretend like this is a uniform electric field with equally spaced parallel lines, just to keep the problem simpler. OK, so voltage is electric height. Voltage difference is then E times height difference. And what we could calculate now is what is the voltage difference between these two locations? If we define the height zero here and therefore the voltage zero here, what will be the voltage here at the location of the person's hand? 
let's call this I for initial, F for final. Well, that voltage difference would be E times height final minus height initial. We're assuming we know the electric field to be 3 million newtons per coulomb. The height difference is 5 centimeters, which is 0 0.05 meters. And if I multiply those, I will find that I have a voltage difference of 7.5, excuse me, 1.5 times 10 to the um, fourth volts. Or another way to say that is 15,000 volts, which is a pretty large voltage difference. Okay, so what does that mean that there's a voltage difference of 15,000 volts? Well, uh, what that really means, voltage difference, really tells us how much electric potential energy a charge would gain or lose if I move it from one place to another in that electric field. So the relationship uh, between voltage and electric energy is similar to uh, the relationship we learned for gravitational potential energy in a gravitational field, which we'll show on the next page. So we're going to use this result for the, that we found for the voltage difference in a certain electric field. We're going to use that relationship and that number now to relate this to how much electric energy a charge would get. And just so I don't have to re redo the picture on the next page, what we're going to look at next is, what if there's a single electron that starts here with an initial speed of zero at the surface of the Van de Graaff? That electron will experience an electric force from the electric field of the Van de Graaff it will be repelled by the Van de Graaff, in other words, and will experience a force to the right, and it will gain speed. It's going to be accelerated as it moves to the right, and we're going to find its final speed right before it hits my hand. And we're going to need these numbers to do that. All right, so what is the relationship between voltage difference and electric energy. Well, we learned that gravitational potential energy is simply, when we have a gravitational field, is the mass of an object times little g, the gravitational field, times the height relative to your reference level. That's really only true for a uniform gravitational field, but that's the only kind of gravity field we've worried about. So we'll stick with that formula. Analogously, the electric potential energy in an electric field, instead of a mass moving from one place to another, we would have a charge. So M is analogous to Q. Instead of a gravitational field, we're talking now about an electric field. And height is still height. Again. This would only be true for a uniform electric field. The electric potential energy of a charge, Q, in a uniform electric field, E, is simply QEH, which is just like MGH for gravitational energy. Now, we know that if we have a uniform electric field, that E times H is simply the voltage. So voltage, being the product of E and H, what voltage tells us, really, is how much electric energy a charge would have at different places. So U electric is QV. It turns out that this formula is always true, even if we don't have a uniform field. It's still true that the electric potential energy is QV. So that's what we're going to use for our problem. Um, 
<coughs> so the problem was the goal is to find the final speed of that electron in the last situation. So we're going to use conservation of energy just like we used to use conservation of energy in gravitational energy problems. So we have, um, we have to define our system. So in a gravity problem we would define our system to be the mass plus the earth. Earth is making the gravity field. And we would do that so that our system is isolated and the total energy kinetic plus potential energy would be constant. So <clears throat> analogous to that, in this problem, the system will be the electron, which is our mass that's moving around, plus the Van de Graaff. The Van de Graaff is analogous to Earth because it's the thing making the electric field. So if that's our system um, and we're ignoring friction in this problem, we have no external forces on that system. It's an isolated system. And therefore, there's no work. And so we learned that the work is equal to change in energy. That's our work energy principle. That's going to be zero because there's no forces to do any work. Therefore, EI is equal to EF. Now in this problem, the kinds of energy that we're thinking about are kinetic energy plus electric potential energy. We're not going to worry about gravitational energy of this system. It's not really important. So KI plus UI must equal KF plus UF. But now we're talking about electric potential energy. So we said back here that the initial speed of the electron was zero, so there is no kinetic energy. Also, the initial potential energy is going to be zero because voltage is E times height, and we defined our height to be zero here, so there's no voltage at this position. So in this problem, initial energy is zero. Kinetic energy, you will remember the formula, is one-half times the mass times the speed squared. Electric potential energy is just Q times capital V, which is voltage final. So you might think that um, this, this isn't possible. How could these two guys add up to zero? Well, it's going to be fine. Uh, because there's going to be a negative number here. Q is going to be a negative number. So we'll be okay with the signs. Um, the goal was to find that final speed. So we solve for VF. I'm going to subtract Q times voltage final from both sides and then solve for VF. I'm going to get negative 2Q voltage final divided by mass square root. <clears throat> um, I want to take a minute to point something out here before we put in the numbers. When we have electric potential energy, Q times voltage, I want you to notice that there's no absolute value here on that Q. All right, that's different from when we did um, electric force formulas. We had a formula before that said electric force was absolute value of Q times E. But that's because that was really the magnitude of the electric force. We wanted the magnitude of the charge. When we do electric energy problems, it's important that there's not an absolute value on that Q because um, we want to make sure that a positive charge gains electric potential energy when it moves to a higher voltage place. When this electron 
which is negatively charged, moves to a higher voltage location, it's actually losing electric potential energy, even though it's moving to a place of higher voltage. So you can think of this when we have negatively charged objects. It's like they're falling upwards, up in the sense of opposite to the direction of the electric field. So negative charges fall upwards and they gain kinetic energy and lose electric potential energy when they do that. A positive charge would fall downwards in that same electric field. It would uh, gain kinetic energy and lose electric potential energy when it falls in the other direction. Okay, let's go back to putting in our numbers and we can finish the problem. So the final speed is going to be negative 2. I have to remember the charge of an electron, which is negative 1.6, 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. The final voltage we already decided was 15,000 volts. The mass of an electron, it turns out, is a very small number, 9.1 10 to negative 31 kilograms. Then we have to take the square root of all that. So you can see right here that those two minus signs will cancel out and we'll be, we will not be having to take the square root of a negative number. All right, so, uh, well, if I sub in these numbers, I will get um, uh, very close to 10 to the eighth meters per second, I rounded off a little bit, for the final speed of that electron, which is a very, very fast speed. It's 100 million meters per second. How did it get going that fast? Well, it had a very small mass, and it was accelerated by a fairly big voltage difference, 15,000 volts. So that's the final speed of the electron. So what we've seen is a way to use our conservation of energy ideas, uh, choosing an isolated system, and now we can do a problem where with conservation of energy involving electric fields, very similar to how we used to do problems with conservation of energy in a gravitational field.